Grove of the Unborn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabithat. Grove of the Unborn by Lynn Venable. Tyndall heard the rockets begin to roar, and it seemed as though the very blood in his veins pulsated with the surging of those mighty jets. Going? They couldn't be going. Not yet, not without him. And he heard the roaring rise to a mighty crescendo, and he felt the trembling of the ground beneath the room in which he lay, and then the great sound grew less and grew dim, and finally dissipated in a thin hum that dwindled finally into silence. They were gone. Tyndall threw himself face down on his couch, the feel of the slick, strange fabric cold and unfriendly against his face. He lay there for a long time, not moving. Tyndall's thoughts during those hours were of very fundamental things, that beneath him, beneath the structure of the building in which he was confined, lay a world that was not earth, circling a sun that was not Sol, and that the ship had gone and would never come back. He was alone, abandoned. He thought of the ship, a silver streak now in the implacable blackness of space, threading its way homeward through the stars to Sol, to Earth. The utter desolation which swept over him at the impact of his aloneness was more than he could endure, and he forced himself to think of something else. Why was he here, then? John Tyndall, third engineer of the starship Polaris. It had been such a routine trip ferrying a group of zoologists and biologists around the galaxy, looking for unclassified life-supporting planets. They had found such a world circling an obscure sun halfway across the galaxy, an ideal world for a search expedition teeming with life. The scientists were delighted. In a few short months they discovered and catalogued over a thousand varieties of flora and fauna peculiar to this planet, called Arrow, after the native name which sounded something like Ahaharo. Yes, there were natives, humanoid, civilized, and gracious. They had seemed to welcome the strangers. As a matter of fact, they had seemed to expect them. The Arillians had learned English easily, its basic sounds not being too alien to their own tongue. They had quite a city there on the edge of the jungle, although in circling the planet before landing the expedition had noted that this was the only city. On a world only a little smaller than Earth, one city, surrounded completely by the tropical jungle which covered the rest of the world. A city without power, without machinery of any kind, and yet a city that was self-sufficient. Well-tilled fields stretched to the very edge of the jungle, where high walls kept out the voracious growth. The fields fed the city well and clothed it well, and there were mines to yield up fine metal and precious gems. The earthmen had marvelled and yet it had seemed strange. On all this planet just one city, with perhaps half a million people within its walls. But this was not a problem for the expedition. The crew of the Polaris and the members of the expedition had spent many an enjoyable evening in the dining hall of the palace-like home of the Rahal, who was something more than a mayor and something less than a king. Actually, Aral seemed to get along with a minimum of government— all in all, the Earthmen had summed up the Arillians as being a naive, mild, and courteous people. They probably still thought so. All of them, that is, except Tyndall. Of course, now that he looked back upon it, there had been a few things. That business about the bugs, as the Earthmen had dubbed the odd, ugly creatures who seemed to occupy something of the position of a sacred cow in the Arillian scheme of things. The bugs came in all sizes— that is, all sizes from a foot or so in length up to the size of a full human. The bugs were not permitted to roam the streets and marketplaces like the sacred cows of the earthly Hindus. The bugs were kept in huge pens, which none but a few high-ranking priests were permitted to enter. And although the earthmen were not prevented from standing outside the pens and watching the ugly beasts munching grass or basking in the sun, the Arillians always seemed nervous when the strangers were about the pens. The earthmen had shrugged, and reflected that religion was a complexity difficult enough at home, needless to probe too deeply into the Arillian. But the time had been something else again, bringing with it the first sign of real Arillian fanaticism, and the first hint of violence. Tyndall and four companions were strolling in a downtown section of the city, when all at once a hoarse cry in Arillian shattered the quiet hum of street activity. "'What did he say?' asked one of Tyndall's companions, who had not learned much Arillian. I, "'I think—a time, a time. What could—' He never finished the sentence. 
All about the Marillions had prostrated themselves in the rather dirty street, covering their faces with their hands, lying face down. The earthmen hesitated a moment, and a priest of Aral appeared as though from nowhere, a wicked scimitar-like weapon in his hand, and a face tense with anger. "'Dare you!' he hissed in Arillion. "'Dare you not hide your eyes at a time!' He pushed one of the earthmen with surprising strength, and the latter stumbled to his knees. All five men hastened to ape the position of the prostrate Arillians. They knew better than to risk committing sacrilege on a strange planet. As Tyndall sank to the ground and covered his eyes, he heard that priest mutter another sentence, in which his own name was included. He thought it was, "'You, Tyndall, even you!' A few moments later a bell sounded from somewhere, and the buzzing of conversation began around them, along with the shuffling, scraping sound of many people getting to their feet at once. A hand touched Tyndall's shoulder, and an Aurelian voice, laughing now, purred, "'Up, stranger, up! The time is past!' The earthmen got to their feet. Everything about them was the same, as though nothing had happened, people strolling along the street, going in and out of shops, stopping to chat. "'I guess that was the all-clear,' commented one wryly. The others laughed nervously, but Tyndall was strangely troubled. He was thinking of the strange words of the priest. "'You, Tyndall, even you!' Why should he have known, and not the others? He tried to forget it. Arillian was a complex tongue with confusing syntax. Perhaps the priest had said something else. But Tyndall knew one thing for certain. The mention of his name had been unmistakable. The mood hung on, and quite suddenly Tyndall had asked, "'I wonder about the children. Why do you suppose it is?' One of the men laughed. "'Maybe they feed them to the bugs.' At no time during their stay on Arrol had they seen a single child, or young person under the age of about twenty-one. The crew had speculated upon this at great length, coming to the conclusion that the youngsters were kept secluded for some reason known only to the Aurelians, probably some part of their religion.' One of them had made so bold as to ask one of the scientists, who politely told him that since his group was not composed of ethnologists or theologists, but of biologists and zoologists, they were interested neither in the Aurelians, their offspring, nor their religion, but merely in the flora and fauna of the planet, both of which seemed to be rather deadly. The expedition had had several close calls in the jungle, and some of the plants seemed as violently carnivorous as the animals. It was just a few days after the incident that the Aurelians kidnapped Tyndall. It had been a simple, old-fashioned sort of job, pulled off with efficiency and dispatch as he wandered a few hundred feet away from the ship. It was late, and he had been unable to sleep, so he had strolled out for a smoke. The night watch must have been somewhere about on patrol, probably only a few hundred feet away on the other side of the ship. It happened suddenly and silently. The hand clapped over his mouth, the forearm constricting his windpipe, his legs jerked out from under him, and a rag smelling sickly sweet shoved under his nose, bringing oblivion. When he came to consciousness he found himself in this room, and he knew that since then many days and nights had passed. His wants were meticulously attended to, his bath prepared, his food brought to him regularly delicious and steaming, with the generous supply of full-bodied Aurelian wine to wash it down. Fresh clothes were brought to him daily, the loose-flowing, highly ornamented robe of the Aurelian noble. Tyndall knew he was no ordinary prisoner, and somehow this fact made him doubly uneasy. And then, to-night, the ship had blasted off without him. Tyndall could easily reconstruct what had happened when his crewmates had inquired about him at the palace and in town. Tyndall? Then a sorrowful expression, a shrugging of the shoulders, a pointing towards the death-infested jungle, and a mournful shaking of the head, sign language which in any tongue meant, Tyndall wanders too far from your ship, he becomes lost, alas, he does not know our jungle and its perils. Those who spoke a little English would make some expression of sympathy. Maybe the crew was a little suspicious, maybe they thought there was something fishy about the thing and then they thought of the unhappy results of what was commonly referred to as an interplanetary incident. Ever since the people of the second planet of Alpha Centauri, in the early days of extraterrestrial exploration, had massacred an entire expedition because the captain had mortally insulted a tribal leader by refusing a sacred fruit, such incidents had been avoided at all costs. And so they dared not offend the Aurelians by questioning the veracity of their statements— 
and the jungle was deadly, so they looked a little longer and asked a few more questions. After a little while the scientists had completed their work and were anxious to get home, and so the ship blasted off without him. All this had passed kaleidoscopically in Tyndall's mind as he lay on the couch in his luxurious prison, too numb to weep or even curse. His reverie was broken by the clicking of the lock, and he raised up to see the door opening. An Aurelian servant stood there, his silver hair done up in the complicated style which denoted male house servants. He was unarmed. The houseman smiled, roared in imitation of a rocket, made a swooping gesture with one hand to indicate the departing ship, then pointed at Tyndall and at the open door. The servant bowed and departed, leaving the door slightly ajar. Now that the ship was gone, he was free to leave his room. Tyndall stepped cautiously out of the room and found himself in a long hall, with many doors opening from it on either side, much like a hotel corridor. One end of the hall seemed to open out onto a garden, and he started in that direction. The doorway opened out into a patio which overlooked a vast and perfectly tended garden. The verdant perfection of the scene was marred only by one of the bugs, sunning itself and gnawing on the stem of a flower. Tyndall was impressed again with the repulsive ugliness of the thing. This one was the size of a small adult human, and even vaguely human in outline, although the brownish armoured body was still more suggestive of a big bug than anything else known to him. There were even rudimentary wings furled close to the curving back, and the underside was a dirty striped grey. Tyndall shuddered, wondering why the Aurelians, who so loved to surround themselves with beauty, should choose so horrendous a creature as the object of their worship or protection. He heard running footsteps behind him, and turned to see the Aurelian houseman, breathless, with an expression of greatest concern on his face. The servant bowed respectfully before Tyndall, then gestured at the garden, shook his head vigorously from side to side, and tugged at the earthman's sleeve. "'Forbidden territory, eh? Okay, old fellow, what now?' The servant motioned for Tyndall to follow him, and ushered him down the hall from whence he had just come, and into another of the rooms opening off from it. The very old man, reclining upon the low, Roman-like couch, Tyndall recognised as once as his host, the Raal of Aril. The Raal touched the fingertips of both hands to his forehead in the Aurelian gesture of greeting, and Tyndall did the same. He noticed several male Aurelians standing near the back of the room, though the servant had bowed and retired. "'Well, Tyndall, how do you enjoy the hospitality of Aharil?' He, of course, gave the native pronunciation to the name, which was almost Teutonic in sound and unpronounceable for Tyndall, because of the sound given to the double aspirate, for which he knew no equivalent. "'Your English, Debral, has improved greatly since our last meeting,' commented Tyndall guardedly, using the Aurelian prefix of extreme respect. The old man smiled. "'Your friends were kind enough to lend me books, and also the little grooved discs that make voice.' He gestured towards an old-fashioned wind-up type phonograph, which Tyndall recognised at once as being standard aboard interstellar vessels, and for just such a purpose. The Raal continued— for teaching English very fine. How are you enjoying our hospitality, I ask again? Tyndall was stuck on Arrol, and he knew it. There was no need to cook his own goose by being deliberately offensive. I appreciate the hospitality of Arrol. I express my thanks for the consideration of my hosts, but if I may ask a question? Yes. What, in the wisdom of the Debral, is the reason for my, er, uh, detainment? To answer that, Tyndall, I must tell you something of the past of Aharil, and of her destiny. At these words the other Aurelians in the room drew closer, and the Raal motioned them to a couch at his feet, and nodded toward Tyndall, requesting that he join them. Tyndall noticed that the others were gazing up into the old man's face with an expression of raptness, even of reverence. He knew that the Raal did not possess an especially exalted position politically, even though he was head of the city. He guessed, therefore, that the Raal must be the religious leader of Aral as well. The Raal began, intoning the words as though he were reciting a ritual. There was a time, many thousands of Khrilas ago, when the kingdom of Aharil was not one small city as you see it now, but a mighty empire, girdling the world in her vastness. 
but the people of Ahareel had become evil in their ways, and her cities were black with sin. It was then that Sheev himself left his kingdom in paradise, and appeared to the people of Ahareel, and he told them that he was displeased, and that bad times would fall upon Ahareel, and that her people would dwindle in number, and become exceedingly few, and the jungle would reclaim her emptied cities. One city, and only one, would survive and prosper, and the people of that city would be given the chance to redeem Ahareel, and remove the heavy hand of Sheev's terrible punishment. All this came to pass, and in the dark Hreelas that followed, all of Ahareel vanished except this city. Now, for many thousands of Hreelas, the people in this city have striven to redeem Ahareel by obeying the sacred laws of Sheev. Sheev had promised that when the punishment was ended he would send a sign, and his sign would be that a great silver shell should fall from the heavens, and within should be Sheev's own emissary, who must wed the ranking priestess of Sheev, establishing again the rapport between the kingdom of Paradise and the world of Ahareel. When the Raal had finished, the other Aurelians in the room fastened the same look of reverence upon Tyndall, which they had formerly reserved for the Raal. Tyndall chose his words carefully. "'But there were many aboard my vessel. Why did you, Deb Rahl, select me as the emissary of Sheev?' "'Sheev selected you. I recognised you, as of all your companions, you and you alone have the sun-coloured hair, which is the sacred colour of Sheev.' Tyndall was able to question the Rahl almost coolly. The trap was already sprung, the ship was gone. Now he only wanted to know the how and the why an accident of pigmentation, only that had brought him to this, sun-coloured hair. "'But, Deb Rahl, did my friends and I not often tell you of ourselves, of the place from which we came? A world, a world like your own.' The old man smiled. "'Do not think me naive, Tyndall. I am quite aware that you are but a man, a man from another world, although quite an incredible world it must be.' I know also that you were, until this hour, unaware of your destiny. I knew that when my priest reported that you ignored the ritual of the time, until literally forced to obey. That is why we had to use devious means to make certain that your companions would not prevent the fulfilment of the prophecy. Now, of course, you understand. I do not think the priestess Lyharisa will make you unhappy, Tyndall. This was not earth, and these people were not earthmen. The thought now did not bring the bitter pain it had at first, right after the ship left. Earth already was becoming hazy in Tyndall's mind, a lovely globe of green somewhere, somewhere far, and home once, a long time ago. No, the Aurelians were not Earthmen, but they were human, and an attractive, gracious race. Life would not be bad among the Aurelians, especially as the espoused of the ranking priestess of Aral. Tyndall fingered the rich material of his Aurelian robe. He thought of the food, the wine, the servants. No, he decided, not bad at all. One thing, though, this priestess, I Harissa. I have, then, but one request to make. Deb Rahl, I would like to see the priestess, I Harissa. The old man almost chuckled. That is understandable, Tyndall, but it is not yet the time. Tyndall, revelling in the strength of his position, grew bolder. I would like very much, Deb Rahl, to see her now. The Rahl's face darkened. Very well, Tyndall, but I warn you, do not enter the grove. There is death there, death that even I am powerless to prevent. The guardians will not harm her, but any stranger will not live many minutes in the grove. I will not enter, Deb Rahl. Tyndall, the time is very soon, possibly this very hour. Will you not wait? I prefer not to wait, Deb Rahl. The Rahl gestured to a young Arillian. Bahil, show Tyndall to the grove of the Princess Lyharisa. The younger man protested. But Deb Rahl, so near the time, what if— Do as I command, snapped the Rahl. Bahil turned silently, motioning for Tyndall to follow. The young Arillian led Tyndall the length of the corridor back to the patio he had stepped onto by mistake earlier in the day. Behil stepped respectfully aside. Tyndall looked out into the garden. The sun was beginning to set, the long shadows stretched across the dim recesses of tropic greenery. 
The huge insect-like thing was still there, stretched out in a narrow strip of sunlight, catching the last failing waves of warmth from the sinking sun. Tyndall turned to the Arillian. Oh, "'Where might I find the Princess Lyharisa?' he asked. "'There, Deb Tyndall. "'I see no one. Where do you say?' Bahil pointed. "'There, Deb Tyndall, where I point. You see the Priestess Lyharisa taking the late afternoon sun. Unless your eyesight is exceedingly bad. Deb Tyndall, you cannot fail to see.' Tyndall's eyesight was exceedingly good. He followed that pointing finger, past the pillar that supported the roof of the patio, past the first row of alien green plants, past the second and third rows, to the clearing, to the little patch of sunlight, to the thing lying there, that monstrous misshapen bug, the bug, the priestess Lyharisa. Tyndall felt a pounding, skull-shattering madness closing in on him. It was a joke, of course. No, not a joke. A dream, then. No, not that, either. In only a few split seconds it happened. Tyndall had leapt the rail around the patio and was streaking through the grove, heading for the outer boundary. The city! If he could get out of the grove, there would be places to hide in the city. Narrow streets, empty cellars, dim, dim alleys. They'd never find him there. Run now, run, before he was overtaken. But he was not being pursued. Bahil stood still on the patio, transfixed with horror. He heard the Aurelian terrified cry, Deb! Tyndall! and then a rope shot out and grabbed him by the ankles. Not a rope, really, a green something, and there were others around his arms, his chest, his hips, wrapping him in their sticky green embrace. The guardians. He tried to cry out, but one of the verdant fronds enveloped his throat so tightly he couldn't utter a sound. The innocent green things of the grove were vigilant guardians indeed. They seemed to be merely holding him immobile, but Tyndall realised with sick horror that their pressure was increasing, so little at a time, but so steadily. And something was happening out there in the sunlight, too. The creature had convulsively grasped the branch of a bush and was clinging weakly to it, great tremors racking its body. It seemed to be struggling, suffering, dying, even as he was. In his agony, Tyndall laughed. "'A time! A time!' the voice came from the patio. Tyndall saw Bahil throw himself face down on the floor, covering his eyes with his hands. He heard the cry echoed within the palace, and then, like a mighty roar, outside in the city. And then there was silence, silence broken only by the sound of his own breathing, as he dragged his tortured lungs across his shattered ribs. He saw the bug give a great heave, and then it seemed to split open, the entire skin splitting in a dozen places, and a hand— a hand reached from within that dying hulk and grasped the bush to which it clung, a white slender hand on a fragile wrist, and then the arm was free, a woman's arm, a beautiful arm. Tyndall began dimly, and too late to understand. A leg kicked free, the slender ankle, the amply fleshed thigh. Tyndall clung to consciousness doggedly. The guardian was crushing the last dregs of life out of him now, and even the pain seemed to recede. His mind was very, very clear. So that was it. A word once heard in a long-forgotten classroom, and then the scientists of the expedition. Metamorphosis. He had meant to ask them what. But he remembered now what it meant. A passing from one form into another. Had he failed a biology test once because he didn't know what metamorphosis meant? Dimly, dimly, he saw. The last thing Tyndall ever saw was the priestess Lyharisa, as she stepped out of the empty hulk, kicking it away with a disdainful toe. Breathless from her ordeal, she sank to the grass, her breasts heaving with exhaustion. She sat there for a few minutes in the sunlight. Then she tossed her head and spread her long raven hair out on her shoulders, the better to dry it in the waning sun. End of Grove of the Unborn by Lynn Venable